Hello Revolution students and welcome to another episode of our study of China AOS 1. This video is going to look at the new culture movement which began in 1914 and continued into 1918 and connected to or became the intellectual foundation of the May 4th movement which we'll look at in a subsequent slide. So the new culture movement was an intellectual movement um, it emerged during World War One, and it was centred around Beijing University uh, and academics, intellectuals who worked at Beijing University, one of the centres of the New Culture Movement. Uh, the New Culture Movement uh, arose as a result of the Qing reforms to the education system in China when the Qing uh, attempted to create a modern educational system. Uh, which opened up education to Western ideas. Western ideas started to get studied more in China and this also led to a decline in Confucian influence in the education system. <clears throat> and as a consequence of all these new ideas entering into China, Chinese intellectuals and writers started to question what it was to be Chinese. One of the main aims of the new culture movement was to achieve a unified China free of foreign and warlord rule. So if we think back to um, our study of Yuan Shikai, so Yuan Shikai passed away in 1916 and because there was no uh, leader strong enough to keep China unified, it fragmented into separate uh, sort of mini-states run by the warlords. The uh, in Chinese intellectuals who were a part of this new culture movement, they um, they were critical of warlord rules, so they wanted to get rid of the warlords and they also wanted to get rid of and remove out of China um, the control of uh, British and the French over parts of China, particularly those treaty ports and the economic rights that they had. Um, key features of the new culture movement were it was anti-Confucian in uh, learning and values, so it was very critical of the old which had the old Confucian style of learning, um, the Confucian education system, which had been dominant in China for 2,000 years. Um, it was very pro-Western learning, so pro-Western, looking towards Western ideas to uh, you know, find solutions to the problems that China was facing. There was a big focus on looking or studying uh, Western philosophy Western science, uh, Western political theory. So many of the uh, intellectuals, Chinese intellectuals early on were studying um, Western liberal democratic systems, um, liberalism and so forth. It also promoted vernacular language. So <clears throat> the language that was spoken day to day between Chinese um, and many of these writers wrote in a vernacular style rather than using the classic Confucian uh, writing style that had been dominant in Chinese intellectual writings for centuries. And then finally, once again, um, it was anti-warlord and it was anti-foreign imperialist. So uh, the new culture intellectuals and writers, they believe that by changing China's culture that um, uh, and the way Chinese thought about themselves, this would be a revolution in itself, which would uh, lay, the, lay the foundations for a modern free China. The key figures in the movement were Chen Dushui, who was an editor of New, New, uh, New Youth magazine, which was based, I believe, in Beijing. Uh, Li Dazhao, who wrote for New Youth magazine and was also an editor for a time of New Youth magazine. These two individuals are very significant, particular in um, later, later events that we're going to study in the uh, history of uh, China and, and, the com and communism, the establishment of communism in China, because these two figures are the founding fathers of the communist movement in China when the Communist Party uh, was uh, formed in the early 1920s. These, were, uh, these two leaders were the leaders of the communist movement. Chen Dushui, he, he was more of a classic Marxist and he believed in the role played by workers in, uh, in creating a revolution 
in China. Li Dazhao, however, he, uh, he adapted Marxism more to the Chinese situation, Chinese circumstances, and rather than workers, he believed that the peasants played a, a primary role. He, he believed that the peasants were like the primary revolutionary class in China. He's interesting because Mao Zedong has a connection with him, and uh, Li Dazhao and his ideas actually influenced Mao's own ideas about the role of the peasants in a revolution. Uh, the next, <clears throat> the next key figure was Lu Xun, and he wrote various things. Diary of a Madman was probably one of his most uh, famous works. He was very critical of Confucian learning. And then finally, uh, Ding Ling, and there's a picture of Ding Ling there, on on the left. So she became a communist quite early on, and she was a prominent uh, played a prominent role in the Communist Party. She um, she was at Yan'an. And uh, and then uh, she remained a communist, even though she was put in prison for, at one point for um, criticizing uh, the party party elite and their privileges. But she did survive, and she remained a communist. And then, right up until and through the Cultural Revolution, um, she was persecuted during the Cultural Revolution. She survived that; not all communist leaders did. And I think she lived up until at least the nineteen eighties. So she's uh, one of the survivors. Um, and then I suppose the final point here is that the new culture movement contributed to the May 4th movement. It was the intellectual foundation of the May 4th movement. And we'll see um, the May 4th movement's very significant because uh, this is when Marxism really uh, gained a foothold in uh, Chinese intellectual circles um, and was the beginning of, I suppose, uh, the communist movement in China, but we'll get to that. And there is a quote from Chen Duxue, the strength of our country is weakening, the morals of our people degenerating, and the learning of our scholars is distressing. Our youth must take up the task of rejuvenating China. And then I'll just end with a couple of historical interpretations. Okay, so our two historical interpretations for the new culture movement. We'll start with uh, Morris Meisner. So he writes, to regenerate China, the new youth intellectuals advocated a cultural revolution, for they believed that transforming the consciousness of the people was the essential precondition for meaningful social and political change. When he's referring to the, uh, the new youth intellectuals there, that's the uh, intellectuals who wrote in New Youth magazine, such as Chen Jishui, Li Dazhao, etc. And the second historical interpretation comes from uh, Rana Mitter. He writes, intellectually and socially, uh, it was one of the most promising and exciting times in Chinese history. So anyway, there are your two uh, in historical interpretations for the new culture movement. I hope this video has been useful for you and I will see you next time when we look at the May 4th movement. Goodbye.